Hello, I'm Fred Kemp. I'm president and CEO of the Atlantic Council, and I'd like to welcome you to this future foreign policy event hosted by the uh, Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security's New American Engagement Initiative. Those are important words, New American Engagement Initiative, because we think we have to use different tools or even refresh old tools and use them in more creative ways for the world that we've got ahead of us. And that's what NAI, NAEI is all about. Um, this is the first of this future foreign policy series. These events are aimed at bringing fresh ideas into the foreign policy discourse and finding new constructive ways for the United States to engage with the world and the world we're looking at in 2022 with Russia, 100,000 troops near Ukraine borders, China and Taiwan, Israel, sorry, Iran crossing the 60% enrichment target. We do need some new tools. We're honored today to host former uh, president of the World Bank, Ambassador Robert Zellick. Bob is, an eminently is eminently experienced in all the machinations of international affairs at the highest levels on down. Uh, he's a historian as well, who has taken lessons from the past and shown how they can be applied to our current moment. He's particularly knowledgeable, well, he's knowledgeable about a lot of things, but he's particularly knowledgeable about the role of trade and economic power. And in his recent book, America and the World, it's just a great read. Uh, uh, he details how the Reciprocal Trade Act of 1934 came to be, uh, the life's work of Cordell Hull, America's longest serving Secretary of State, this legislation transformed U.S. trading relations with the rest of the world. Uh, this was one of the great examples of a moment in history that informs where we are today and where we should be headed in this era of increasing trade protectionism. And he and Hull had that same sort of era and the fight for Hull and that in his era to lower tariffs and reduce trade barriers points to what a counter -mo movement to today perhaps could look like. Uh, I could talk about these great lessons from history with Bob all day, and indeed, I did it through a lot of my career at the Wall Street Journal uh, before I came to the Atlantic Council, where I frequently gained from conversations uh, with Bob Zellick and Ambassador Zellick as he served in senior government responsibilities, and we chatted in places from Washington to Berlin and to Davos. We're proud to count him at the Atlantic Council as a member of our International Advisory Board. It's now my pleasure to turn to another friend and colleague of some years, Susan Glasser, uh, who will moderate. Susan is a staff writer with The New Yorker and global affairs analyst with CNN. Uh, she has co-authored a biography of James Baker, who was a colleague of, uh, of Bob's in the first Bush administration. If there's nothing else you take away from this event today, Bob, by Bob Zellick's book, and by the biography of James Baker uh, by, uh, by, uh, by Susan uh, and Peter. And, and thank you to both Susan and Bob for joining us today. I'm sure your conversation will, in keeping with the, the spirit of this series, generate a lot of innovative ideas. Uh, there's no better time for this, as I said. Those of you who are tuning in, if you have questions for the Q&A portion of the event, please submit them through the Q&A function on Zoom. Uh, and with that, over to you, Susan. It's great to see both. Thanks so much, Fred. And of course, thanks to you and the Atlanta Council for hosting us today. Uh, in the sort of shameless book pluggery, I appreciate uh, the nod to the Baker biography, but the subject of our conversation today is Bob Zellick's fantastic book, America in the World, which I highly recommend. I'm, I'm really struck in that introduction from Fred, Bob, as I'm sure that you are with, you know, the juxtaposition of this urgent need for fresh, urgent, creative, new ideas to reinvigorate American diplomacy. But at a time when the very big sort of almost fundamental existential questions about the role of the United States in the world are being reevaluated and where there's not really certainties about what uh, ends we're aiming toward at the moment. And uh, of course, this is against a backdrop of pressing crisis. And your book takes a historical perspective to the question, not only of America and the world, but specifically of the role of economic statecraft uh, in American diplomacy over the centuries, often not the first uh, resort 
and first response of American policymakers. And yet, I want to start off with with today's pressing crisis, I guess. Uh, Help us understand uh, why it is that, you know, economic sanctions again and again and again have both become increasingly the default of American policymakers in recent years. But at the same time, you look at Russia with 100,000 troops on the Ukraine border and a great fear that the U.S. has been in a cycle of sanctions over and over again. And obviously, that's not an off-ramp that has deterred Vladimir Putin at all. So how can you help us understand what's happening with Russia today in the context of the thinking you've done about economic statecraft. Thanks so much. So first, uh, Fred, thanks thanks for having both of us. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be uh, with Susan in particular, since uh, the book she wrote with Peter is such a fantastic, uh, interesting work about Baker, as you kindly said, my colleague. I think he was a little bit more my boss for uh, uh, about 10 or 12 years, I guess. Um, so, um, and one thing I just to, because this is a, to come up with new ideas. I I think what what Susan uh, and I discovered is that uh, not all wisdom is new ideas. <laughs> Sometimes there's old ideas that you can sort of draw from. So part of my uh, approach in writing the book and talking with people today is to think about how you can draw on history in in addressing problems. I did that as a policymaker and I would encourage a younger generation to do so. But to, to, to come to Susan's question, um, well, Susan, as you know, there's actually some historical precedents for sanctions. Uh, we started to do it uh, during our revolution. And then of course, Jefferson uh, had the great idea in 1807 to embargo all trade with Britain and France uh, as part of to teach them a lesson about the Napoleonic Wars and it didn't work so well. Uh, So sanctions have a mixed history. That doesn't suggest that they can't be a tool. They tend to be most effective as a tool when they're narrowly focused. Um, So, for example, in the issue of uh, this sort of goes to questions more of export controls and limits with a set of technology. Um, There's an argument that they did help with South Africa and, and move the political process. But to be blunt, to answer your question, People often apply them because uh, they're not sure what else they, uh, they, they are ready to do, either in terms of military or other action, um, but they want to signal uh, their displeasure. And uh, in that sense, I don't think they should be uh, always the, the, uh, the sole reliance. And to, so as to take your issue of Ukraine today, uh, I'll draw an analogy to uh, the person I talk about in the first chapter, Alexander Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton learned during the revolution that credit and economic strength was going to be fundamental to the new country. Uh, and, and when he becomes secretary of the treasury, this is his, his heart of economic statecraft. He not only creates the financial system, he creates a revenue system to fund it. And he has a foreign policy neutrality that's basically designed to make sure that we have trade because 95% of the revenues come from the customs side. So let's ask ourselves with Ukraine today, One of my concerns is that Putin has the initiative. Putin is the one who's defining the problem and the US and the West are basically in a reactive mode. And we signal, as you point out, we might be able to take sanctions. If he takes uh, aggressive action, we'll really try to penalize him. But uh, even there, there's questions about the coherence with the United States and and Europe and particularly uh, Germany on some of the issues. So going back to your experience with Baker, um, if you're gonna negotiate, it helps to have leverage. And it also helps uh, that you can take the initiative. So one idea that I haven't heard discussed, uh, but actually uh, the predicate might've been laid by the visit of the senators to Kiev over the weekend, would be for the United States to work with Canada, which has a large Ukrainian immigrant population, as well as Europe, and to go to Ukrainians and say, the key to your success and your independence uh, and your democracy will be the, to have effective governance and economy, which they frankly struggle with and they're struggling with today. And to emphasize that Ukrainians are gonna have to come together. And if they do, that the United States and its allies 
will be willing to invest rather significant sums to make sure that Ukrainian democracy works. Now, this has another benefit. It sends the message to Putin without necessarily applying U.S. military forces that the United States and Europe will back Ukraine and that if Ukraine is attacked, Ukraine will get economic support and uh, and that this is going to be a long term struggle to try to uh, overcome Ukraine, which frankly is now increasingly anti-Russian. I'd combine it with another point of leverage, which is, I think, one of the it would have been much better in the past years, but it should be the case now that we should make sure that Ukrainians have the weapons to defend themselves. I don't believe that the United States was willing to go to war over Ukraine. We have to be careful about making threats that we're unwilling to uh, to follow through on. But I do think that we can supply Ukrainians with the weapons, uh, anti-tank, missiles, other sort of radar capacities to warn Putin that this would be a dangerous exercise. Now, having said that, uh, I believe you should combine it with the type of offer that the administration seems to have been providing. In other words, to say, look, we are willing to negotiate conventional force limits, which is, you uh, may recall, Susan, was, was partly done with the CFE agreement at the end of the Cold War. We're willing to discuss nuclear weapons and missiles, which was also done at the end of the Cold War. We're willing to discuss notifications and exercises, as was done with CSE and OSC. And frankly, our strategic view is, is that Ukraine should have a constructive relationship with the West as well as Russia. I don't think we can reasonably expect that it won't have a relationship with Russia. But it has to be done in a negotiated way and give Ukraine some additional basis of strength. So what I've partly just done in a few minutes here is to suggest how you could use economic policy both to signal and to strengthen Ukraine, as opposed to being in a position where each day we open up the newspaper and see what new move Russia has made. Well, it's interesting. You talk about leverage. Uh, you know, that was almost uh, certainly it was a uh, foundation of what you saw working with Jim Baker at the end of the Cold War. But the U.S. had inherently an enormous amount of leverage as the Soviet system was, you know, unraveling from within, uh, in addition to the external pressures placed upon it. I want to ask you about leverage in regards to, uh, I guess we're referring to him these days as the former president or the former guy, uh, that, you know, he certainly elevated that word to almost a, a catechism when it came to how he spoke about U.S. Uh, relations in the world, and particularly with China, the other uh, sort of ascendant power in the world today. And I, I want to ask you, first of all, help us understand uh, where we are a year into the Biden presidency when it comes to this uh, swing of protectionism or not. What have we kept intact of Trump's approach to China? Uh, what worked, what didn't when you take away the bluster? Help us to understand where that, what appeared to be quite abrupt change uh, in at least attitude, if not overall policy toward China, has it has it yielded any results? Biden has kept some of it intact. Well, there are a number of questions in there, Susan. So let's let's sort of take apart uh, the the pieces. Um, I I think that um, you know the Biden approach has uh, uh, demonstrated. Um, some initiatives in the area of security with allies, which was undermined by the Trump administration. Uh, the AUKUS agreement with Australia and with Britain is not only about nuclear submarines, it's about technology transfer that I think could be important over a longer period of time. Uh, the Quad arrangement recognizes that India is not going to join a form of alliance, but can work cooperatively. So I think those have been constructive steps. Um, and understandably, the Biden administration has also said it wants to try to restore its economic uh, strength at home, although I would have some differences about how it's done that, but that's the logic. What has been really missing is an economic initiative. And this is, and this is so ironic in East Asia, where economics is the point of the realm. Now, the reason for this is pretty clear, which is that um, you know, we've got more protectionists in Congress, including a big part of the Democratic Party. Uh, Biden is sitting on a very narrow margin with a coalition and he has other priorities and he doesn't want to stir up that that hornet's nest. Um, I think that's a mistake. And people in the region recognize that uh, if the United States is not going to signal 
its economic engagement, then the economic gravity of China will be more influential. Now, how might one do this? Well, of course, one way would be uh, to rejoin the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, which Obama negotiated. The British are wanting to do it, the Koreans or others. Now, politically, most people consider that to be a non-starter. Maybe that's so. Uh, given the Chinese, the sort of anti-Chinese momentum, you might be able to reframe TPP. But this is goes to the question about taking initiative. But I have a, another idea, which is the, the digital trade. If you if you look at what's happening in the trading system since the global financial crisis, the growth in merchandise trade has slowed considerably. It's about the same as GDP growth. But services trade and digital trade has zoomed, and it's not sort of only sort of uh, uh, sort of the normal digital networks, but it really deals with kind of every range of manufacturing and services now as involved with cross data flows. Traditionally, the United States was on the leading edge in trying to set standards and rules for leading edge industries because we have a leading edge economy. So we were negotiating, for example, in services and intellectual property long before others uh, did so. But we pulled back. Um, right now, we're not doing that. And so uh, either the rules aren't being framed or they're being framed by other parties. So strategically, it's not only a question of this trade agreement and market opening, it's also who's developing uh, the rules for the future. I believe you could put together a digital agreement that avoids some of the political problems that the traditional trade agreements have, but also signal United States leadership. So what I'm trying to come back to here, Susan, is the notion that um, I think one challenge for the Biden administration has been that it tends to be reactive in policies as opposed to trying to take initiatives that not only are good in and of themselves, but that will also give additional leverage globally. And let me give you another one that, you know, is, frankly, I suggested to their transition team. If you go back and you look at what the Bush 43 administration did with HIV AIDS and PEPFAR, it was, uh, it was something that only the United States could put together. It wasn't only the question of medicines and health treatments, it was also questions of the supply and logistics and delivery systems. Frankly, when the US withdrew from Afghanistan, I would have combined it with a huge sort of PEPFAR initiative that would have helped demonstrate US soft power, it would have had a big effect in Africa and other parts of the world, and we can be pretty good at it. I'm just using these as examples to broaden the notion of tools or economic policy or, or others so that one doesn't just see them, as you described it, as kind of the negative sanctions policy. So let me just get your baseline view on what you think is happening as a result of the COVID pandemic changing and scrambling uh, the international order at just the moment when these questions about uh, America's role in the world are really coming to the fore in terms of our international uh, economic policy, our security policy. So uh, do you see this as a new era of deglobalization or is this more of a temporary uh, uh, crisis that the world will sort of overcome and revert to a modified version of the status quo ante? Yeah, that's a question that's obviously on a lot of people's minds. Um, the phenomena of globalization have not gone away. I mean, if we consider uh, biological security and pandemics, that looks pretty global to me. Uh, climate change issues, international economic issues, not only trade, but we're going through probably a huge energy transition as well as movement away from some extraordinary monetary and fiscal policies that have their uncertainties. So uh, globalization is, is here with us. The governance of globalization has fragmented and frayed, whether it's you know, trading regimes or whether it's cooperation among major economies or a huge series of other issues. And that that's exactly raises the question of when the US thinks about economic policy or transnational issues such as climate and pandemics, um, it needs to, figure out how it can take initiatives with alliances, coalition partners, the, the role of the World Bank and the IMF. You know, it's, it's interesting as a former head of the World Bank, U.S. policymakers rarely think about how to draw the World Bank into their policy system, even though we're supposed to be the ones that have had the greatest uh, control and, and influence. Those institutions can evolve, should evolve, 
and to take the issue of pandemics or climate right now, um, they're going to need to have relationships with some of the UN agencies that frankly have sort of the policy writ, but not the capacity, the operational need. So going back to this pandemic issue, you know, the WHO doesn't have the capacity in the field to deal with healthcare systems all across Africa. The World Bank working with healthcare systems could be of a big help in that and has done some, but in my view, sort of not enough. So when it comes time to the broader question of globalization, um, the United States, if there's any country, <laughs> should be well positioned to kind of pull the levers of this. But then to bring it back to your issue with China, I think one of the unfortunate legacies of the Trump era, which Biden has continued a little bit, is that we're not going to succeed in this competition by imitating China. In other words, we're not going to succeed by closing ourselves off. Um, America's strength is its openness, its openness to goods, to ideas, to people, to capital. Um, and that's what makes us both strong and appealing as a society. And as we've discussed, that's not what we're doing in our trade policy. It's frankly not what we're doing in our immigration policy. And that is the strength that actually helped the United States succeed in the Cold War and before the Cold War. You know, it's really interesting to hear you, you know, talk about openness and that, you know, again, the sort of ideology of uh, that post-Cold War era, right? And I, I guess one of the big macro questions a lot of people have is whether the political shift inside the United States and the sense of, you know, so many interlocking crises has made that uh, uh, basically a message that too many Americans uh, from right to left don't want to hear anymore. And I'm curious what your study of history has suggested to you about answering that question. So we've certainly gone through uh, various pendulum swings uh, and you can think about say the 1920s or parts of the 1930s uh, as, a, as a comparable moment, perhaps. I, I'm wondering, you know, are those, are those analogies worthwhile to you as you look back in history? Or do you think there's, there's a danger uh, in Washington, certainly, of, uh, you know, kind of death by misused historical analogy? <laughs> so um, let me start with the current, but then draw in the history. So you know, one has to be careful of, of polling data, but it's striking The Chicago Council on Global Affairs recent polls show about 75% of Americans believe trade is good for the United States. On globalization, it was like 68%. Okay, not 75, but a heck of a lot better than the president's numbers. Um, and what that, and of course, you know, what you then see dominating the debate are the fringes. So you've got sort of a progressive protectionist group and you've got sort of a reactionary economic isolationist group on the right. We know how that influences the political system, but it doesn't seem to be where the American public is. And in fact, on a lot of these issues, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs has done these polls year after year. The numbers have been actually sort of on the rise in a number of these topics. I mean, if you think about it generationally, don't most young Americans understand the interconnectedness of what's sort of going on in the world? Now, having said that, you know, I understand from real world experience, putting together the coalitions, you know, framing issues, trying to sort of shape uh, that generalized inchoate opinion into policy is a challenge, but that is exactly the task of the leadership. Um, and frankly, going back to the historical example, whether there's the, take the one that Fred talked about in, in my book we, uh, with, uh, with Hull and the Reciprocal Trade Agreements Act of 34. This was four years after uh, the Smoot-Hawley tariff, which raised average tariffs to 59%. Now, if you read that account, you realize it wasn't an easy switch. After he got the authority to give the executive branch the ability to negotiate these agreements, he had a lot of political sensitivities that he had to manage. I mean, partly in your discussion of, of Baker with the Canada Agreement or NAFTA or others, you get, this is, these are not slam dunks arrangements, but it does require focusing on accomplishments, results, outcomes. Again, something you would have seen from your Baker book as a way of trying to generate public support, um, but it won't just happen on its own. I mean, so let's take another, take another interesting example. So, I focus on North America in my book because almost all of the foreign policy people never spend time with North America, but it was obviously important in American history in the 19th and 20th century. And let's ask ourselves, what type of foreign policy issues are most Americans interested in? 
Well, immigration, narcotics, organized crime, environment, economics, that's all the North American agenda. Um, but uh, one of the interesting legacies of, of NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement, was that it was much more than a trade agreement. It was trying to interconnect the United States and Canada with a transforming political and economic change in Mexico. And after 25 years, despite all the complaints, it was successful enough that, that uh, Trump couldn't kill it. Uh, Trump obviously wanted to get rid of it. He couldn't, it was because it was embedded into the system. And if you think about President Lopez Obrador of Mexico, he was no fan of, 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 Trump, of, of NAFTA either. So now we have the USMCA, which made some changes that I think are a mistake, but nevertheless, it, it re-endorsed the agreement. But in very practical terms, Susan, one of the issues will be how do we deal with the new labor standards? And those could be used to either help strengthen unions in Mexico, which would be constructive, or they could be used as a tool for protectionism. So what I'm trying to sort of draw from these examples, and I'm doing it with it particularly because you've studied sort of Baker's method, is you have to have the ideas, but then you have to get into the details about how you're actually going to shape the policy. And then in the process, you have to bring along public and congressional support. So I know we have a bunch of great questions from the audience, and I want to turn to that and our colleague Emma Ashford in just one second to do that. So let me give you a final question, because I, I feel like this is such an important thing where you're, you're giving us a lot of ideas at the moment and looking ahead as well as looking backwards. Uh, but, but let me ask you this, a big picture question to, to end this great conversation on. As you've studied America in the world, uh, going back all the way uh, to Hamilton and to, you know, the, the earliest years, <laughs> the earliest years of the Republic. What, what, where do you think that conversation rests today? I mean, right now it's a very inward looking moment, uh, not just in our politics, uh, but also in our, our own sense of what's possible, which is, seems very much at odds with our continued economic strength and, you know, the size of the economy, the role of innovation and technology, which you've spotlighted, uh, you know, where do you come down? Are we just too negative at the moment relative to our capacities? Uh, or is this really a pivot point juncture for us? Well, if you would look through history, people would probably find a lot of pivot points. Uh, uh, Civil War, <laughs> Revolution. Um, there's a quite interesting one in 1900 uh, where the United States rises to global power and you know, how we see ourselves fitting in the international system. That takes 20 or 30 years to work out. Then there's obviously 45 and in a sense, the creation of the alliance system, which most of us has grown up to. And I point out how that basically was, uh, was not planned, but is in sort of relation to events. So if I, if I put that together, I think that the United States capacities are remain enormous. And, uh, but of course, as I said, let's play to our strength, our openness, our innovation, as opposed to trying to sort of pull back and rely on walls and, and, and barriers. That's also, by the way, the strength of our soft power. That's the appeal of American society versus authoritarian systems uh, such as China. Um, but you also have to be practical about matching means to ends. So this is the tension between having sort of uh, ideals of what you'd like to achieve and how you practically can achieve them, whether it's sort of uh, making the world safer democracies, uh, helping to create uh, democratic systems. And this is where I'll connect the economic piece. The economic foundation is often the heart of that. A, it's, it's the foundation of America's strengths. B, it's the, it's the connection with our key allies in Asia and in Europe. Remember the Marshall Plan, the economic connection of Europe and integration, similarly the rise of Japan and Korea and sort of Southeast Asia. Um, but third, it's also the way we connect our private sector. This is going back to the, the trade issue in American past. It's not just mercantilism, it's the notion of private sector innovation or transnational actors. And so it's important to have some sense of design, but also practically, what can you get done that will further that design? So you focused on the period, for example, in 89, 92, when you had this huge transformation globally. And as you saw, there were big debates about, you know, should there be a new Yalta? Should, you know, different arrangements. 
Um, but as you also recorded, where I think Baker had a strength was that he had a sense of direction, but he also had a sense of what are we going to accomplish to get this done? And going back to the tre treasury period with LDC debt and others. So what I'm trying to drive home through the stories in the book, and frankly, what I think your biography helps do is, look, keep your eye on trying to address the practical problems. How do you pull together the politics, the diplomacy, the leverage? How do you, whether you want to call it deal making or negotiations, and how do you use those to build the confidence in the United States, both at home and abroad? All right, Emma, the rest of the tough questions are yours uh, to uh, throw to Ambassador Zellick. And thank you so much uh, for this really robust conversation. I, I do highly recommend the book to everybody uh, in the shameless plug uh, part of this uh, conversation. Thanks, Susan. Great. Thank you, Susan. I, I wish I could actually just keep listening to this conversation. Um, but, but you know, we do, we do have some great questions in, in the chat. Please, if you have further questions, put them in the Q&A here and we will try and get to as many as we can. Um, first, I, I want to take moderator's privilege um, and, and just ask you a question that hasn't really come up so far. Um, you know, in your book, you talk a little bit about U.S. involvement with international institutions uh, on the economic front. You've obviously had substantial professional personal experience with, with those institutions. Um, and I'm just curious, you know, it seems that there's very much a growing ambivalence um, in U.S. politics on, on the left and the right towards the use of some of the global economic institutions, the WTO, the World Bank, the things that, that have sort of undergirded the U.S. economic system for, for decades now, there's a growing ambivalence ambivalence towards them and to what they mean for U.S. sovereignty. And I'm just curious what you think the future role of those organizations um, for U.S. foreign policy is. Is that something we should be trying to rebuild um, or is that ambivalence uh, reflective of sort of we, we need to move on from those? So, Emma, great question. Um, I tend to see it in a network framework. In other words, uh, given my own experience, I would never underestimate the importance of national power and national initiative. So sometimes this, this debate is framed as multilateralism versus nationalism. I think that's a false distinction. I mean, the United States was most effective as a national power through our alliance arrangements, the economic arrangements. We extend our influence uh, through that mechanism. And going back to my, my dialogue with Susan, insofar as we don't use these institutions, insofar as we undermine these institutions, insofar as we close ourselves off from the institutions, we're, we're, we're undermining the very instruments of power that we helped create. But because it's framed as often sort of a, a gooey, gooey internationalism versus national patriotism, uh, it draws the sharp distinction. So what I think the most successful American leaders have recognized that nationalism and internationalism are two sides of the same coin, okay? And if I could give you a sort of a wonderful little symbolic aspect of this, you know, someday for those of you that still carry wallets, take out a dollar bill and you'll look and you'll see the great seal of the United States on the back. And on the, on the reverse of that, you've got this unfinished pyramid. Notice it's unfinished. The eye of providence above it and novus Ordus decorum, new order of the ages. So from the start, Americans were trying to build a country, but they were thinking about how this would influence sort of a, a larger international uh, sense of politics. Now, to bring this in practical terms, these international institutions also have to adjust and adapt. And, and for example, uh, whether it's the IMF or World Bank, you can see how they've changed over time. Because they are bureaucracies. It, you're either dependent on kind of the leaders uh, taking a particular sense of initiative and or kind of the major shareholders. And this is where the U.S. Uh, should be willing to know how to use these institutions very effectively. And by the way, now and then there may be ways that you can work with other parties kind of on neutral ground. So let me give you a practical example. One actually I've discussed with the head of the IMF. As I've alluded to, I think we're gonna go into a phase now where um, because of uncertainties of monetary and fiscal policies plus pandemic, you've got some risk factors out there. Um, we saw in 2008 and 2009, the financial crisis, how important it was for the major economies to cooperate as they partly did through uh, the G20. Um, but what about if the IMF 
took invited the key economies that participate in the special drawing rights, the SDRs. So that would be the United States, China, uh, the EU, and the ECB, the central bank, uh, the UK and Japan are the five key members. And just had a set of quarterly sessions where we one reviewed what's going on in the international economy, risk factors, you know, what one might be able to act about it. In a way, it's almost like a resilience or insurance policy because when something bad happens, and the record is something bad will happen again over the course of the decade, if you, you're going to need those players to cooperate. And so the difference, for example, over the past five years now is that I'm not sure we're in that position with China. And if you look at the the, the China's uh, sort of size in the international economy, you can't ignore that factor. Now, what I'm saying does not deny the unhappiness with Xi's role with the state and party power. It doesn't, uh, it would, you still need military deterrence policies. But unless you expect regime change in China, you're going to have to figure out how to work with these parties. I mean, and one of the frustrations, Emma, that I have is that people, it's odd, we seem to have only one reference point for thinking of how to deal with big authoritarian powers, which is the Cold War. So people come back with, oh, we need to contain China. Well, good luck containing China, and none of your allies are going to agree with you. So what I'm trying to emphasize, it, it, take, take another one, the WTO has not developed new rules for 20 or 30 years, and so it's falling behind. Now, um, ironically, the United States, which pushed so hard to create the dispute settlement system, has basically tried to paralyze it by refusing to appoint appellate body members. Well, okay, maybe there's things we want to fix, but the U.S. has still not stated, either under the Biden or the Trump administration, what it wants fixed. Well, it's a little hard to get people to help you to fix something if you don't specify what you want, okay? Or if the WTO needs prodding, well, then use free trade agreements or the digital court or others to sort of advance the state of the art. So you're going to need these institutions. And so the United States ought to try to think about how it can leverage them in a way that supports national as well as systemic interests. Yeah, so um, I mean, that that covers a lot of waterfront. So we, we have a variety right. of questions in the chat. Um, and, and as you might expect, we, we have a lot about China. We've touched on some of these answers already. Um, we have one on Russia Nord Stream 2. Um, and, and it seems to me that one of the through lines through a lot of these questions is the notion of what it is that we're trying to achieve. Um, and perhaps, perhaps the implicit assumption in a lot of these is that the US is trying to sort of use its own economic leverage to push other actors, China, Russia, um, to, to do the things that it wants. Um, now, that is obviously not the, the economic order, the economic system that, that we are looking at anymore. As, as you point out, China, you know, growing massively in its dominance in the, in the world economy, we can't ignore that. Um, and so, you know, I'm curious what you think our goals should be. So, you know, we, we use these tools of economic statecraft, but what is it we're trying to do? Are we trying to achieve um, leverage over these countries to change their behavior? Are we trying to push them towards, you know, you alluded to the, the sort of um, responsible stakeholder model. Um, you know, where is it we are trying to get to um, that you think we should be going? Well, at the broadest level, the United States has to focus on its security. Um, and that is a question of both military as well as economic and, frankly, political security, our willingness to accept people winning and losing uh, elections. Uh, go back to the Constitution. Th those, that is the sort of the core element. Um, we've learned over time that um, we are best able to uh, defend ourselves and advance those interests globally if we can work in partnership with others, whether North America, whether with European allies, whether with Asian allies. And moreover, those partners end up becoming force multipliers on other issues. Now, having said that, there's sometimes a view in the United States that the US can just snap its fingers and tell people to do this, that, or the other thing. It doesn't quite work that way. That's sort of the nature of, of diplomacy. So, um, and then you wanna create a open environment in which you can encourage others to continue to move towards that system, but be realistic about the fact that institutional cultural changes, breakdown of societies, these are not easy issues to, to, to overcome. Now, then you have to take that concept and, and apply it in, in each circumstance. So let's, let's take China since that's sort of one that gets sort of mentioned a lot. You see, um, 
I, I think the United States is making a mistake when, um, while there's things that we clearly are frustrated with with the Chinese economy, if you ask yourself, sometimes we act like we want to break the Chinese economy. Sometimes we act like we are worried that it's going to collapse. Sometimes we think we want to push to open it for us. We don't have a consistent view on this. And I think that the Trump approach, which was basically a managed trade purchasing arrangement, went exactly the wrong direction because it strengthened the state power. And by the way, it also fell about 40% short of what, what its goals would be. So what does that mean? It means that you do need to sort of have a type of relationship with China where you can uh, talk about problems to whether manage them or sometimes to improve them. And let's take, for example, intellectual property rights. So you know, China has now recognized that it has its own interest in more intellectual property rights. And it created a series of intellectual property rights courts that were fining for foreigners about 85 to 90% of the time, but the penalties were too low. So what we should be negotiating is higher penalties. We have a problem with forced technology transfer. A lot of the forced technology transfer, I think is inevitable because of the joint venture requirements. So I'd be pushing against the joint venture requirements. Now, I personally think that Xi's taken uh, a direction with his sort of state center policies that is, is going to make the Chinese economy less effective over time. But there, there will be opportunities over time when China recognizes its mistakes and moves to try to shape and influence Chinese policy. There's more of a debate on these topics in China. It's quite quiet now because of Xi's power. But I think we're a mistake by not trying to connect with it and others. And so my, what I'm trying to suggest in each of these cases is, you know, you, you need to be thinking about how the United States can advance systems of rules that serve its security, economic and political interests, but in a very practical way and not trying to be overly idealistic of what can be accomplished overnight. Well, I think I'm afraid that we are out of time, um, but I just want to thank you so much for joining us today, Ambassador Zalek. It's been a really interesting conversation. I'm sorry uh, to everybody we didn't get to all the questions, but we really appreciate everybody joining us today. Um, you know, I think some of the the things that I have taken away from this this conversation are some of the core principles that NAI has been talking about here at the Atlantic Council for the last year and a bit. The notion that um, you know, new modes of engagement matter, but, but sometimes they're not new. Sometimes we have to go back in history and pull up the things that used to work and see if they work in, uh, you know, in the new situation that we find ourselves in. Um, and in particular, I appreciated, I think, your thoughts for the administration um, on not just the importance of, of economic statecraft um, or its limits, but on the notion that we really need need to have goals, that we need to think about what it is that we want, what is practical and, and how we might achieve that. So thank you again for joining us and thanks to everybody for watching the event here today. Um, we look forward to seeing you at future foreign policy events here at the Atlantic Council. Thanks for having me, Emma. Thanks to your audience.